good morning, CRCC, or good afternoon or good evening uh, whenever you're watching this. Uh, this is our attempt to kind of walk you through Holy Week, and uh, I'll be posting one of these videos uh, on my YouTube channel every day. Bear with me. I'm not a YouTube expert. I don't have any editing software, so this is one take. Uh, but the goal is to hopefully encourage you and, um, you know, that the Lord might strengthen you this week uh, and just cause you to walk in some incredible fruitfulness. Um, as we mentioned yesterday in Sunday sermon, it's awfully dark out there, but there's an awful lot of opportunities for the people of God to preach the gospel, to stand strong in righteousness. The Lord is calling the church back to the word of God, and it's not an easy thing, uh, but if we can... If we can get a hold of our, our biggest enemy, which right now is uh, that person in the mirror, uh, because the uh, the enemy called the devil has a limited amount of authority. So if we can get a hold of that person in the mirror, we can get a lot done for the Lord and, uh, frankly, live more joyful, contented, and peaceful lives. Uh, this first time I've tried something like this to kind of walk through chronology uh, as it relates to Holy Week. I'll say here right at the outset that there's some debate about when stuff happens, but I think uh, overall uh, it's it's reasonably reasonably clear and um, and prayerfully, like I said, you'll be encouraged by all of that. We had a good time yesterday. If you missed yesterday's sermon, hopefully that will be up soon. Hopefully the notes are already up, but that will be up soon. We were talking about the King of Kings entering to Jerusalem. I have my notes here from yesterday, and we talked about an awful lot. Uh, I was so glad to be back in the pulpit. I think I preached over an hour or so. Uh, thank you all for being patient with a brother. Uh, but we had a good time. We talked about uh, what it meant for the Lord to enter Jerusalem and kind of made some corresponding remarks to how that meant a change of everything. And of course, we can relate that to ourselves when the Lord enters us, uh, when he comes in fullness and when he saves us, then everything shifts. And Everything that we had built our identities around now reorients around Christ. And we talked about how that's a wonderful thing, but how that can be a difficult thing. Well, we mentioned the humility of Christ entering into Jerusalem on a donkey, not only the fulfillment of, of prophecy, but also a great statement and testament to the humility of Jesus. And we looked briefly, uh, we talked briefly through some of his statements. Uh, for example, the son can do nothing of himself or my teaching is not mine, stuff like that, that he said throughout his ministry, demonstrating a deep and abiding humility and a commitment to the, the mission of his father. And so that's obvious that we ought to try to emulate that sort of uh, humility. Uh, we looked at uh, just a quick exhortation concerning faith. And uh, when the Lord tells us to do something, even something like go find me a donkey, right? <laughs> uh, how we ought to be willing to, to, to say to the world, the Lord has need of this. Uh, but also be willing uh, to do the mundane things, to do the things that aren't so glamorous and glorious, but they're still nevertheless redemptive and prophetic. And so we talked a little bit about that. And uh, let's see, let's see. We talked about, of course, the great flip that happens this week where people in that day hailed him as Messiah, the son of David, the king that's riding into Jerusalem in the fulfillment of prophecy, and then just a few days hence, would, uh, would turn their backs on Jesus. And so uh, I think every year we remind ourselves, you know, to, to make sure that our loyalty to Christ is, is in place. I think one of the great lessons of, of Palm Sunday is to remind ourselves that we'll always be tempted uh, to be disloyal. Uh, loyalty is not a popular virtue these days, period. It's not popular to be loyal. It's actually kind of cool and hip to be disloyal. <laughs> so, so anything that involves loyalty, whether to, to, to God, uh, to a church, to a family, to a marriage, to a person, is not the, the you know, you're almost seen as weak if you're not willing to just walk away from, from, from people. Uh, so we have to, rem since that's in us, we have to remind ourselves uh, to, to keep our loyalty to Christ, regardless of what the world does and regardless of what, of what happens. Uh, and of course, we talked about how he came into the city. The city was moved. It was agitated. It was it was in an uproar, like a bomb went off. We said, um, and of course that that only ramped up as the week goes on. Overall, uh, and then of course we talked about who Jesus actually is. And so it was a it was a good it was a good 
uh, I guess, restatement of some things and, and a reminder of a few things yesterday. And I pray that if you missed it, you will go ahead and grab it. Now, uh, on, when it gets posted, you'll watch it. Today, <clears throat> there's a couple things I wanted to do. Um, one, I wanted to keep mining a little bit of information from Palm Sunday because the, Luke's narrative gives us a, a few more verses to consider, uh, a little bit more detail or a few more statements that, uh, that, that Matthew's narrative does not give us. So I want to do that. Then I wanted to talk about some Monday events and uh, probably the most significant of, significant of which is the cleansing of the temple. We might talk about uh, the uh, cursing of the fig tree, but uh, the, the, the cleansing of the temple, I think, is, is probably where I want to spend most of my time. So what I want to do, if you have your Bibles, hopefully you do, go over with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And I want to read uh, just a little bit of, of how Luke uh, how Luke's gospel, you know, the narrative that he gives us concerning Palm Sunday and what happened on that day that Matthew's gospel doesn't give us. And then we'll get into more Monday events. But I, I thought this was worth worth your time. So I'm going to Luke chapter 19 and I want to read from verse 35 down through verse 44. And I'm keeping my eye on the length of this video. I want to go forever. But uh, I thought this was worth the time. So we're still kind of in Sunday here. Uh, so I'm in Luke 1935. And they brought him to, uh, to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. As, and as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, and so this here's some detail that we didn't get over in Matthew, saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. So there you see an acknowledgement of the kingship of Jesus uh, as he enters into Jerusalem. Uh, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Those of, of us who grew up in church have heard this an awful lot. If you don't praise them, the rocks going to cry out. Well, that's where, this, that's where this comes from. Verse 41 says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this day, or this thy day, the things which belong to unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So there you see a very clear prophecy from Jesus that one day Jerusalem would be surrounded by its enemies and destroyed. And of course, we saw that in, in 70 AD. And he said the reason for that, at least in part, was they missed the time of their visitation. Now that's ironic because when our Lord entered Jerusalem, here we see in Luke's gospel that they even called him king, right? So they laid their clothes down Right? There were palms in the air and on the ground. There, was, there were messianic titles being thrown around. Son of David, they were rejoicing. They were praising God because the king had come. And yet, the Lord says, you missed it. You missed it. Um, first, he rebukes the Pharisees because the Pharisees were trying to get all this praise stopped. And he said, they ought to praise me because indeed, if they don't, the stones would immediately cry out. That speaks, of course, to the creation of God, uh, rendering him, him honor and praise. Uh, and if so if, if things that don't have a, uh, have a conscience, have a mind, have a soul, uh, just praises God by, by virtue of being, being creation or being the, the creation of God, then how much more then should we who have a mind, have a soul, have a conscience, render honor and praise to God? Uh, but then... 
he begins to weep over Jerusalem. He begins to be sad over Jerusalem. Um, Bible says here, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in, in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace. In other words, I'm coming first to you. And even the, in the midst of all this honor and in the midst of all this praise, he, he knows that they missed it and he begins to prophesy. There's a time coming where because you're going to go on to reject me, of course he knew that, uh, that you're going to be destroyed. And th this image here of, of knowing not the time of thy visitation is, again, extremely ironic because they seem to be acknowledging the time of their visitation, but yet the Lord is saying very clearly that they don't know the time of their visitation. That's that's challenging, isn't it, saints? I mean, it, it, it for me, it makes me wonder, Lord, <laughs> check me, because there's some things that maybe I think I know that I, I don't. And it reminds me to stay teachable. You know, hopefully it's reminding you to stay teachable. Uh, one of the, I guess one of the big problems in in the church today is that we're so confident in what we know is there any room for the Lord to reveal what we don't know? Right? Uh, and then are we willing to make the adjustment? And the scary part, and this is, this kind of gets into the fig tree a little bit here too, because they're very close together. The scary part is that on the outside, it looks like they knew. They were praising God. They were worshiping the Lord. Um, I mean, verse 41 he beheld the city and wept over it, even as they were worshiping, because he knew that they still didn't get it. It's scary because, you know, that old saying, you can have church and the Spirit's nowhere around. You can have church without Jesus. You know, us. oh, Lord, don't let that be us, <laughs> where we just come in and have, and we got praise going and worship going and missed our visitation, missed it, right? Missed the essence of what the Lord is trying to do who he is, uh, praising him his way, seeing him our way, putting him in a human box, uh, but missing the essence of what of what the gospel really is or, or what love really is or what righteousness really is. It, it really ought to make us pause and think. So I just want to throw that out there from, from Luke 19 and, um, and get a little bit now into, I mean, these, these issues are related, uh, get into what happened on essentially Monday morning or sometime uh, on Monday. Now, there's some debate as to when Jesus cleansed the temple, uh, but I want to take you over to Mark's gospel uh, because Mark gives us a little bit of the chronology, and this is why most people think the second temple cleansing happened on Monday. So go with me to Mark, friends. Uh, Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, uh, verse 11. Mark 11, 11. Go with me to Mark, and uh, and we'll read it from Mark, and then we might back up and go back to Matthew. But apparently the Lord cleansed the temple twice. The first one we read about is over in John's Gospel, in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, at the beginning of his ministry. And then now at the end of his ministry, he seems to cleanse the temple again. And there seems to be a couple of reasons for that. One compelling argument I read for that is because the Lord was fulfilling his role as high priest. You might recall in the Levitical law, it was the priest's job to go and inspect the house, right? And so I read one, uh, one theologian who said this was the Lord's role as high priest, coming in, inspecting the house, giving instruction, and then coming back to see how it's all, how it's all going. Uh, before he condemns the house or shuts the house down because it, it's not gotten any better. So you might recall that uh, from reading through the Old Testament. And so that's that's very compelling, actually. And that seems to be what's going on here. Over in John 2, the Lord, uh, you know, condemns what was happening at the temple. And here he also condemns what's happening at the temple. And now it's shutdown time. It's about to go dark. Uh, so let's look at Mark, Mark 11, 11, Mark 11, 11. <clears throat> and Jesus entered into Jerusalem. This is right after the, the entry, the triumphal entry. 
And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Verse 12 says, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, before we, we go on there, I've heard a, a few different takes on this. One of the one of the interpretations that I find awfully compelling was that the tree, by advertising itself, you know, itself from afar as full of life with with full leaves, and you get to the actual tree and there's no fruit. Uh, the Lord was condemning the tree based on what he saw in Jerusalem, what he would go on to see in the temple. You seem to be full of life. You've worshipped me. You've praised me. Yet there's no fruit. He goes on to the temple here in a few verses, and there's a lot of activity. There's this hustle. There's this bustle. The leaves are full. Yet there's no fruit. And the condemnation that comes upon the tree, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, right, is the condemnation that comes upon the temple. It's about to be destroyed. There won't be one stone left upon another, for you miss the time of your visitation. So again, these, these, all these lessons are interconnected. Um, and you see kind of the chronology, uh, forgot to mention that, that he seemed to kind of watch, go into the temple, look around, uh, make a Levitical inspection, write a high priest type inspection, retire to Bethany for the evening, come back the next morning, which would be Monday. Even though Matthew's gospel, it seems to run it right in, Mark gives us a little bit more, more detail. So you, you see these interconnected um, judgments, really, this, this, this reality that the thing that looked alive was actually dead. The thing, the people that seemed like they understood actually didn't. That activity and stuff going on doesn't necessarily mean that those things were pleasing to God. Uh, and so he curses the fig tree. He curses the fig tree. Now, he took it out on this tree, but it, it's just a tree. It was obviously an example for the people who called themselves people of God to hearken and heed. You guys, it looks like you got a bunch of leaves, but when you get close, upon further inspection, there's no fruit. Now, as a pastor, again, terrifying, terrifying, y'all, terrifying, right, that there's worship going on and praise going on and humming going on and all is going on. And you, But if you look a little closer and you lift up the leaves where the fruit should be, is there any there? Right? Is there any there in your own life? Your family looks good on the outside. Get a little closer. Hopefully it looks good on the inside, right? Your own heart. Man, you can say the right things. You can, you got the Christian phrases and Christian jargon down. The leaves look beautiful. But then you lift up the leaf or you get a little closer and then what? See, that's the lesson here, or at least one of the lessons here. And the Lord's response to that thing that looked alive, that's actually dead, is devastating. He curses it. He curses it. Thank you, Lord, for mercy. But he curses it. And it doesn't get any better. If you keep reading here in Mark, we're in Mark now, uh, chapter 11, verse 15. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. Should be terrifying, by the way. <laughs> any church leader. And overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. 
And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. I mean, he was messing up the money, right? He was messing up the, 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 the franchise. He was, he, was, he was disrupting the bottom line. So they're trying to kill him. Not only that, but he was rebuking them because in their leadership, they had let these things go on. And then he comes and says, obviously, you guys are bad leaders because you should have known better than this. So he was, so it was in a personal affront to the, to the religious leaders, and it also messed with the bottom line. And if you want to make somebody mad, insult them personally and mess with their money. Right? And he did both. And they were trying to kill him. And verse 19 says, and when even was come, he went out of the city. If you go back to where we are in Matthew and look at uh, chapter 21 and verse 12, Matthew 21 and 12, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And of course you see the mercy of God uh, in Christ. The, Verse 14 says, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Uh, and we, so we'll go on from there. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of those those other things uh, tomorrow. But I just kind of wanted to part for a few moments on this whole this whole issue of, of the Lord cleansing the, the temple. If you go back with me over to Mark 11. Um, Is it not written, my house shall be called? of all nations, the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves after having condemned selling and buying in the temple, after having thrown over the, the money tables, the money changers, kicking over the seats of them that sold doves. This, this is a lot going through my mind as we read this. First of all, this doesn't seem to be the kind and gentle Jesus that everybody thinks that he is. Now, of course, our Lord is kind. Of course, our Lord is gentle when our hearts are broken. Uh, he's, he, he extends grace, right? He wraps us up in his arms and loves on us. But if you read the Gospels, when the Lord was really harsh, it tended to be towards the religious leaders. Uh, for example, he, he may have been extremely gentle, if not out, if not out and out prophetic with the woman at the well or the woman caught in the midst of adultery, saving her from death and ushering her on. Or, uh, I mean, I mean, the examples uh, go on and on throughout, throughout the Gospels of the Lord's gentle nature. At the same time, when it comes to people who, who should know better, uh, people who should be rejoicing that he's there, people who are in charge of the holy things, and people who are in charge of leading other people, you know, his his words get a little harsher. And, and you know, this is a prime example of that. The Lord goes into the temple, most likely after retiring at Bethany, coming back the next morning, according to Mark's gospel. The Lord goes into the temple and creates pandemonium. I mean, absolutely creates pandemonium. Uh, this is a very different Jesus. This is a Jesus that it, that's filled with righteous wrath and in, in some respect judges the temple, judges the leaders in this instance of doing things that they ought not to have done. Um, immediately, all of us who love the Lord and love his church ought to be thinking about what's proper in his worship. Immediately, it, it ought to come to mind. Immediately, every pastor, right? Every deacon, every saint of God who loves the worship of God. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, we, we all love the lifting of our hands and music and, and, and we need to. But, but, but immediately, something ought to spring up in our minds that says, Maybe we can't worship the Lord just any old kind of way. Maybe we need to be 
careful, maybe a little bit more circumspect. And I know that language says to people that, you know, it kind of ruins the fun, kind of ruins the buzz. It kind of, you know, no one kind of likes that. We want to just be able to transplant everything in the world into worship. I mean, I was there when I was a young man. As I've grown and, and walked and, 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 and seen things and, and, and looked at trees that seemed green and leafy and there were no figs. Um, Y'all, I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, what this makes me want to do is, is first of all, pray and ask the Lord for forgiveness and then be a little bit more careful examine our church, examine our worship, examine our our processes uh, based on scripture so that the Lord is pleased in his own worship. Because here's, here's the problem. Well, here's a possible problem. Can you imagine worship that people love but God hates? I mean, everyone's feeling great. This is great. But God's going, the son of God goes into the temple, looks around. They have no idea that, 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 that they're being visited, not in the way that they truly are. And we've seen that already. They seem to know, but didn't know. So he goes into the temple. He inspects. He looks around. Most likely, he goes back to Bethany. He comes back the next day and lights the place up. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us to be the kind of church and the kind of people that, not, that don't miss your visitation, certainly. Uh, the manifestation, the power of your spirit among us. But also that please you in our worship. In Jesus' name. Saints, I, you know, one of the goals this week was for you to see what the Lord was thinking and how he was feeling as best we can from the scriptures so that we can kind of immerse ourselves into the week. And Holy Week gets off to a bang. Before he goes to the cross, he goes to the, to the church. And the cross wasn't pretty. His visit to the temple here wasn't pretty. And the, so the Lord of the, of the temple shows up and the religious leaders have the nerve to question where his authority comes from. In real subtle ways, perhaps we do this too. The Lord of the church says, here's what I want. We question. Oh, this happens so often. We question whether or not we ought to obey that. Some of you might wonder why I have issue with, at least in our own church, um, we don't, I would love to get certain tools into your hands and so forth, but we, we won't do it on the Lord's day. And, you know, it, it comes from stuff like this, from being corrected over the years, going, boy, we, we just really need to devote this day to prayer and, and study and worship, um, the doing of good deeds, et cetera. Um, but then there's more. The Lord says, hey, here's how I want my worship to look. Here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. I wonder what would happen based on the word of God if the Lord physically visited the church today. I wonder what would happen if the Lord walks into our services as an observer and looks around. Let this be a week where you determine in your mind that in the time of visitation, and of course I don't mean You know, in context, he literally was there physically, but I mean, in the, in the time where we gather for worship and 
ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Determine in your mind that you're going to ensure that his house is a house of prayer and that the things that are done there would not merit him turning over the tables, taking out a, a lash or a whip or something and going to town. And maybe you're a pastor somewhere outside of our church who somehow caught this video somewhere. Pastor, I would, I would admonish you just like I'm trying to do, and I do so very imperfectly. I would admonish you to use the scriptures to, to determine what proper worship is in the church and where worship has become improper. I mean, think about the Lord's priority here. He comes into Jerusalem. Okay, he comes into Jerusalem his last week on earth prior to the cross. And his first priority, using the symbolism of the fig tree, his first priority is to go to the church. I would admonish you to, to search the scriptures to see what's proper and what's not. And it's going to get you in trouble. It is. Because you're going you're gonna to see in, those, in the scriptures areas where we have decided we know better than God. And if you're bold enough, you're going to try to usher the church back to what looks to be biblical and honorable before the Lord. Audience of one, right? He's the audience of worship. And you it's probably not going to be pretty. We're in a pickle, y'all. Holy Week is a, is a great week to repent. <laughs> it's a great week to repent. I was telling a, a friend not that long ago, we were kind of having a friendly debate, you know, about some, some worship areas. And I was saying, man, we were kind of laughing about it, but we were kind of sad too. And I was like, man, we... We have, we have scripture saying don't do and we do. And then we have scripture saying do and we don't do. And we celebrate it. As opposed to being broken, as opposed to saying, Lord, help me. We celebrate it. What a great, merciful God we serve. Oh my goodness, that was 30 minutes. All right, let me bring this down here. So we serve a great and merciful God. This is this. There's no condemnation here, but I, you can't read this and not do a self check. You know, they still didn't get it. They put him on a cross. He cleanses the temple twice. They kill him. They 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 dig in. They bear down. They like the like the people in, in the book of Revelation where, you know. All kinds of stuff was coming out of the sky and killing people, and they refused to repent. These guys, they refuse to repent. They don't take his cleansing as a loving, a loving correction and rebuke from a loving God, but they scheme to kill him. How often has this happened in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, where we don't take the Lord's correction in a loving way? And say, oh, thank you, Lord, for correcting me. Now help me obey. Mm -mm. We're going to scheme to do it our own way. I don't know how there's ever going to be revival when we aren't willing to lay down our own agenda for his. So let me pray for you. Let today be a day where you examine yourself as a member of the church, as a part of the temple. And um, all you leaders out there, in my own church and everybody else, if you happen to stumble upon this video, you'll answer to God as I will for what you allow in the church. Yes, we want to have love, joy, life, fun, but all those things have to be lawful. So Father, thank you for anything good in this little video. Uh, Lord, thank you for as we consider this week all you've gone through, thank you, O oh Lord, for your great mercy and your great love. Uh, thank you for sending your Son, Father, to die for our sins. And thank you for the Lord Christ being our substitute, uh, doing what we could not, dying in our place. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for choosing us. Uh, 
Salvation is of the Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, because we certainly can't save ourselves. We love you. I pray a special blessing upon Calvary Bible Church, Chesapeake, upon everyone who will watch this video. I pray that you'll bless them, that you'll keep them, that you'll give them a great thirst for your word, Lord, that you'll make them more loving people, more forgiving people, and also increase their boldness to stand for what thus says the Lord. We bless you now, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, friends. Again, one take, so any errors, charge it to my head, not my heart. And uh, maybe I'll get better at this as time, uh, time goes. Uh, but have a great week, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.